So part of the reason I needed a pen is because I've already screwed up the first slide. Um, Attila is a former grad student of mine, and he's at the Bank of Portugal now. Uh, so this is this paper is really about combining what I've done on dynamic discrete choice to search models, and all a lot of the stuff I've done in the past has been focused more on discrete time. I'm really fascinated by continuous time despite the fact that I've never taken a class on differential equations. So and you're gonna see that in this paper, despite it being a non-stationary model, we're gonna completely avoid solving any differential equation. So the motivation is that standard uh, search models have offers arrive at some rate. Workers then have sort of a strict cutoff for taking a job, which would be the reservation wage. Um, I see this as complicating estimation. Modibo probably thinks it's a walk in the park. Um, but we also need this feature where you see in the data that lots of jobs involve taking, taking wage cuts. And I think that this is, you could say, well, there are, you know, postel benet robin models which would involve you taking a wage cut because you're gonna, your growth is gonna be a lot higher. That's not gonna do the trick with the amount of wage cuts that we see and the size of the wage cuts. So we're gonna need something else. Um, and when we think about non-stationary models, you can think about non-stationary models arising in many settings. We have unemployment benefits expiring. You can think about there being duration dependence and offer arrival rates, announcement effects of policies. And these typically are gonna involve, uh, in the, even this very simple model, uh, solving a nonlinear second order differential equation at each iteration of the optimization procedure. And so that's sort of what the Vandenberg paper does back in 1990. And there've been sort of a few papers since then, but not that much because it's sort of a pain to deal with these things. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a preference shock that's gonna affect the value of a job offer. And that's sort of where you could think about the integration of what we see with dynamic discrete choice models. So the classic uh, Russ bus engine paper, that was exactly what, what they were doing. There was a, a prefer unobserved preference term associated with the decision. We're gonna put that into this sort of model. We're gonna do it a particular way, which is in an instantaneous, uh, Cost. So you think about more like a signing bonus as opposed to something permanent about the job that affect, that's an amenity. If you give me that, um, things are going to work out quite nicely. In this case, an offer wage W will be accepted probabilistically from the perspective of the econometrician. And future job offers at wage W will only be accepted probabilistically from the perspective of the individual because they're not gonna know what that matching component's gonna look like. Um, once we do that, we're gonna be able to use CCP's, conditional choice probability system at the model, and we're actually gonna have a direct link between what you would see in terms of reduced form hazards uh, to a structural model. So that's been one of the things, right? That having a, a structural job search model and reduced form hazards, they don't actually go that well together. Uh, here, you have a tight link between the two. And the nice thing about this is, if you give me a particular assumption on what that unobserved uh, shock is, we're gonna get constructive identification of the structural parameters. And it works out very simply. So in the stationary case, if you have these reduced form hazards, you could really solve all the structural parameters in Excel. And the key parameters there are gonna be the wage offer distribution, the offer arrival rates when employed and unemployed, utility wages and utility and unemployment benefits. In the non-stationary case, non-stationary is here being associated with unemployment, all structural parameters on the employed side can be solved as in the stationary case. There's gonna be no differential equation that needs to be solved. And actually most of the unemployed parameters are gonna be, have like this nice closed form solution. 
So what are the assumptions we're going to do to make this work? I, I view the assumptions as being somewhat standard um, for toy search models, anyway. We are going to have infinitely lived workers who discount the future at known rate rho. Workers are going to receive some utility from the wage when employed and, be, and get some benefits that are going to be time varying when unemployed. Workers are going to pay a switching cost when they change employers. So that's a little bit different because we don't have this reservation wage uh, thing. When employed, job offers are going to arrive at some rate lambda one and get destroyed at a rate delta. So this is sort of one of the key things. You're not endogenously searching for jobs differently when you're employed at a high wage versus a low wage. There's just a lambda one. And when unemployed, job offers arrive at some rate lambda zero of t, where t is the employment uh, duration. Now, what we are going to have in terms of the offer wage distribution, we're actually going to be working with discrete wages. So it's going to be on, on, it's going to be on a grid, and you'll see why that's important in a second. Uh, and then there's going to be an employed offer distribution and an unemployed offer distribution that can vary over time. And we're going to get closed form expressions for all of those. Okay. And then the key is, is that these jobs are associated with some transitory preference shock, and we're going to have that be a logistic distribution. You could have other distributions for that, but then we're not going to have closed forms for everything. I think we'd still get identification. But could you handle a, a persistent preference shock? There's lots of, lots of actions that happen in people's lives, a joint location decision, a change in what you're doing in terms of your life cycle, where you're going to see people move down the wage ladder. That, those are pretty persistent. Yes, yeah, so if it's, if it's observed, we're in good shape. If it's unobserved, we need it to be transitory. Now, you, you would think about that. Our data is typically not so great that it's to be able to have all these events in the background, right? That's right. So one of the things that you might think would happen in a model like this, so the, work, the key thing is going to be here is that the, for that preference shock to be transitory, right? So if you see somebody who moves to a job that pays some wage, from below, from a lower wage, versus somebody who comes from a job that paid a higher wage. Well, you would expect if that preference shock was um, uh, sticky, is that if you came from a higher wage, you had to have a really good preference shock, and so then you'd be less likely to um, move jobs later, uh, as opposed to if you come from a low wage. And that turns out not to be the case. So, which I was surprised by. What data are you saying that's Well, we're using the Hungarian administrative data. Okay. I don't think that's so, true in the US. Like. Okay. Um, yeah, we were, su we were surprised that, that that would be the case. So you'd say that if you're coming from a wage decrease, you're like, yeah. Yeah. Literally, I'm trying to think kind of how broadly we can think of these preference shocks and the duration time series. On the preference shock side, can this also reflect, for example, some shock to the quality of the job or the productivity of the current job in the sense that, you know, they're, they're just looking for something and you know, maybe that's something worse. Um, or, or is it literally, you know, you, you think people have, have you know, different utilities or different matches. So in other words, is it, is it really, uh, is it really identified as individuals or specific to a worker or is it specific to the match? Oh, so, yeah, we're thinking about it specific to the Mac. Okay. We're going to have unobserved types in the model, and that's going to affect the productivity. It, it, that's going to affect all of those parameters. They're going to have different offer distributions, different arrival rates, everything. And then, so, and then on the unemployment side, if I understand, the, if we're thinking about duration dependence here in terms of the lambda zero and the GWs, um, changing over time, it's, it's really coming from the what firms are offering. It's not like people are getting more or, or so, uh, yeah, so I, mean, I think there's different ways to think about what sort of reduced form this is capturing, mm -hmm. for sure. So you could think about that lambda zero t as being a function of both search effort mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, sort of true right. uh, duration dependence. Uh, similarly, if you thought about the, the wage offer distribution, you know, to the extent that um, workers can target what jobs they're searching for. Well, well, you definitely have that the reservation wage is changing over time. But yeah, but 
this is really about, this is the offered distribution. At the extent that they're able to target that, you, you, would, you would get that. So we've got administrative data that doesn't necessarily solve everything. So I, I don't know. Um, uh, I, I don't have a good sense for that. Um, yeah, I, I, we've looked at it at different levels of the wage cuts. I'll show you a transition matrix associated with different deciles of the wage distribution, and that might give you a better sense for you know, the things that we're talking about. Uh, so, for the purposes of this presentation, yes. Everything's going to go through if you have, you know, exogenous rates. In, well, and you could actually have it be endogenous, but the way we've set it up, endogenous, exogenous rates uh, in terms of moving up or down the ladder within the firm. Uh, you could put all that in there. That's no problem. Uh, you can actually put in amenities for the job. So basically, if you think about... Um, Chris Tabor and some co-authors have a paper in Econometrica that's got compensating differentials and all these different features. So one part that we can't get is the equilibrium wage setting, but everything else we could incorporate from his model easily. Um, so that's sort of what I'm saying here. We can cover lots of extensions uh, you know, in terms of amenities and job types. So Attila, that was his job market paper, is looking at compensating differentials across occupations. And that had different arrival rates of jobs based upon what occupation you're in. You get, you know, if I'm working in education, I'm more likely to get offers from education. Uh, and that sort of setup. You can have on the job wage changes, that's what I was just talking about. You can actually incorporate aggregate shocks. Where we're going to run into trouble is more the case that Modibo's talking about when we think about renegotiating wages. That's not going to work out so well. And you'll see why in like a couple of slides. So let's start with the value function for the unemployed. And we'll just take it from my perspective from the discrete time side and get to the continuous. Uh, so we think about some small time interval delta t. Over the course of that interval, you're going to receive a, uh, an offer with probability lambda zero of t times that delta t. And so when we think about that value function of being unemployed, what do you have? You've got the benefits, then the probability you're going to get that offer, and then you're taking that expectation over two things, what the wage would be associated with that offer, and uh, that transitory shock, the epsilon. And then there'd be some probability that you're not going to get the offer, one minus lambda zero of t, in which case you just stay in the same state. You can rewrite that so um, we're going to take all the V0 of T terms out. So we can factor out a V0 of T uh, from that expectation. And we end up with the expression uh, in that bottom line. And then, of course, we're going to take that delta T to zero. And then this is what gives you your differential equation. Uh, so rho times the value function equals that benefit plus you got the rate at which you're getting the job, the lambda zero of t times the value of the, uh, the job, plus the differential equation, the derivative part. The value function associated with holding a job at time t, that depends on the flow payoff, uw. There's gonna be some rate at which the job is destroyed, delta, in which case you're gonna get the value of being unemployed at time zero. And then there's going to be some rate at which you're getting an offer for a new job. And then again, you're taking the expectation over the wage associated with that job and the epsilon. If you express that future value term relative to not taking the new job, and you, so basically factor out the VW from that expectation, then you can rewrite it like this. Okay.
given everything we've got, now we're back to what's the probability that you take jobs? And the probability you take jobs actually just follows this logit form, uh, given our assumption on the epsilons. And so, you know, it's the same for the employed and unemployed, um, except that, uh, you know, you've got T's in there on the unemployed side. So it just depends on, on T. And the key is, is that these relationships can be used to express the future value terms as function of the CCPs rather than the value functions themselves. So that's good. That's good. You can see there's going to be a mapping between differences in value functions and the conditional choice probabilities. You just do the log odds. So when we think about the value function for unemployment, you know, first step, we take out the part of that expectation associated with the wages. So we're summing over all the GW of Ts. And then um, because of the logic assumption, we get log of one plus EXP of that, uh, that difference for the expectation over the epsilon, which is just one minus the, the probability of take, the log of one minus the probability of taking the job. Similar substitutions to the value function for employment means we can just express it in this way. Okay, so it just depends on the instantaneous benefit, delta times the value of uh, unemployment at a duration of zero, and then a part associated with the probability of taking the job. So what's actually nice, when you're doing CCPs in discrete time, things actually become are a lot more complicated uh, because you could be moving around with all these different transitions. In continuous time, things happen. Uh, no, only one thing happens at any given instant, and that makes everything sort of uh, separate out quite nicely. So actually, the easiest part in continuous time, as long as you give me this epsilon, is the expression for the future utility, because that's just log of the probability uh, of a probability. Okay, so what I want to do is take this model um, and then think about how identification is going to work. And so what are we going to see in the data? We're going to see the hazard rate of moving from a job with wage W to a job with wage W prime. Here you can see why we did it sort of with discrete bins. You could actually do it continuously, but then you, it makes things a little bit trickier. But in this case, you just count the number of times the data you move from W to W prime and divide by the total time spent in W. So we're going to say we see that in the data. We're going to see the hazard rate out of unemployment given duration T to a job that pays W. And delta is going to be given immediately because that's just the hazard rate of moving from employment to unemployment. So if you give me this, we're going to be able to get sort of everything in the, in the model. You mean non-employment rather than unemployment? No. Or did your data actually distinguish between? Sorry, I should say non-employment. Yeah, we're, we're your model calling that unemployment. That's right, but in reality, a bunch of people Are don't. It, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So up in, in these search models, it's gonna be hard to get the offer distribution, in part because you don't even know what the offer distribution is for wages below the reservation wage. Here, you have a probability of accepting anything. That's what the, the epsilon gives you. And the offered wage distribution actually works out really quite nicely. And this is where it's going to be really key not to have the renegotiations. So when you get an offer arrival, that comes from an offer distribution, no matter what your current wage is. And the way to see how simple it is to get the offered wage distribution is that the hazard rate of moving from W to W prime, what's that going to be? Well, it's going to be the rate at which you receive an offer, which is lambda times the probability of that offer paid W prime, that's the F of W prime, times the probability you'd accept the offer given your current wage was W and you're being offered W prime. That's what the expression is. Well, in the setup, the probability that you would accept a wage that pays the same wage as your current one, that's not gonna depend on what the value of the wage is. Right, so if I'm getting paid $10 an hour, I'd probably accept a job that pays $10 an hour. It's the same as if I'm getting paid $100 an hour, but it's probably I'm gonna take a job that pays $100 an hour, right? 
it's going to be the same because you're paying this, the same switching cost. In both cases, the value of the job is exactly the same, right? Because they just they pay the same. So what that means is when we divide by the hazard HWW by HW prime W prime, the lambda one cancels and the, P, the P's cancel. So you're just left with FW, that's the probability of getting a job that pays W, offered a job that's paid W, over the probability of being offered a job that pays W prime, conditional on getting an offer. So this is a property of the model, not of the data, the PWW, but PW prime, W prime. And the data, I don't think that's what you see. Uh, what, well, I'm not sure that we would ever... It's hard because of all the unobserved heterogeneity. So for example, at the bottom of the ladder, you see, the, you also just see an enormous amount of churning going on. So people moving from... Hopping from, you could say, low wage job to low wage job. That's a, that's a, and so unless you somehow have control for, you know, all the other competitive data out there, that's not so easy to control for. Yeah, so I, so I, more than so I, I, I was trying to think of you know, one of the key features of these on the job search models is that as people move higher up the, mob, up the ladder, so they search less because they're just, they're, they're higher up there, so there's fewer opportunities. What, for me, in, in your framework, that's, If you do that, that's going to kill this sort of identification argument. But to your point, it's actually quite that that I can rationalize with this model. And the way that would be rationalizing all those way movements there would be that they're getting lots of offers at the same wage. Whereas if you're at the high end, you're just not getting any offers at that wage. So you're going to account for it through the offers. Yeah, yeah. Because the hazard's going to be. So to, to me, you're saying it's really about the hazard, right? That you're seeing people move from low-wage jobs to low-wage jobs at a pretty high rate. And at the high-wage jobs to high-wage jobs at a pretty low rate. Well, how would you rationalize that? You would rationalize that through the offer distribution uh, working out. But yeah, that, that, that's exactly what's identifying it effectively. Because okay. um, then you sum over the W prime in the, in the denominator, and you've got uh, FW equals HWW over the sum of all those other hazards. So that, in some sense, that is exactly the identification we're, we're getting, where it's coming from. But it would all break down as soon as you do targeted search like that, for sure. Uh, but nice closed form expression, we recover fully the wage offer distribution. Once you have that, things get a lot easier. Um, so now let's think about the offer arrival rate. The offer arrival rate, the logic distribution of the preference shocks, gives you this nice expression for the difference in the value functions minus the switching cost. So the log, the log odds ratio gives you the difference in the value functions for the, the two jobs minus the cost of switching. Well, you could think about doing the reverse switch. Instead of going W to W prime, you could go W prime to W, right? Well, those value functions are then gonna cancel when you add them together, and you'll just be left with two times the switching cost. So that's still not totally helpful yet because we don't know what those P's are, right? Well, we can think about the P as depending on the probability of taking a job that pays W prime, given the current wage is W, is just the hazard of going from W to W prime divided by probably you get an offer, probably conditional getting an offer that it pays W prime. So we're going to substitute that into those log odds ratio. That's what we're going to plug in there. And now the only unknowns in this equation, uh, in the one right are the switching costs in lambda one. We've already recovered the offered wage distribution. We already, the hazards are observed in the data. So we can pick another pair of wages. And you know, so we have this triplet of wages. We can write the, this, uh, there shouldn't be a log in that uh, second one. We can write this equality as multiplying these terms together, right? This one, this one times this one. 
So for any triplet, we've got this, and now we just need to solve that expression for lambda 1, which sort of looks like you're going to get a quadratic. But you don't. It actually turns out that you get something linear. Uh, and that's because the part that doesn't have a lambda, after you cross multiply all that stuff, is going to be 0. It all, all cancels out. And so you actually get a closed form expression for lambda 1. Okay, so the offer arrival rate has the closed form expression. It's a little bit ugly, uh, and, and you need that denominator not to be zero, but it's generally not going to be not going to be zero. And you've got lambda one, and in fact, you're heavily, heavily over identified. Um, so, what was key about this? Well, the symmetry was key because we needed that switching cost to it has, it has to be that. You know, the value functions, um, you go in one way versus the other way. When you add them together, the value function parts cancel out. And then you just left with the switching cost. The other key is that the ability to express it in log odds, well, that came from the uh, logistic distribution on the error. You could work with a different error distribution. You just don't get a closed form, right? Uh, but what's nice about this is what I mean by you could plug these numbers into Excel and Find out what lambda one, lambda one was. So you you can uh, use that I think to get what the I, I think where you could use that information would be thinking about be more flexible on the distribution of the shock. Getting it as soon as you introduce something where the amount of search effort you put in depends on um, depends on what wage you're at. Now you got a problem because I needed the wage offer distribution. The wage offer distribution hinged on that lambda one, not depending on the wage. So you can the null, yeah, I think we could we could do that. Um, so we get a nice closed form expression for lambda one. Once you have lambda one, you immediately get the CCPs because now we have all parts of the right hand side of that formula and you immediately get the switching cost from there. Okay, so the only thing left on the employed side was the utility of the wage itself. Thanks. And for that, now we're gonna go back to the structure of the model the log, consider log odds of choosing to accept a job offering W prime. Now we're actually going to write out what those differenced value functions are. So we substituted in for the VW and VW prime. And what do you get? You get the difference in the flows, UW prime minus UW. Note that the value function going to unemployment canceled out because it was the same. We had a constant job destruction rate. You can relax that. We can have types of jobs that have higher destruction rates. Identification is a little trickier, but everything can sort of go through. It doesn't depend on the wage, though. So for that, when I look across where firms are in the size, wage, and productivity distribution, I see, and, and I thought your answer was partly, oh, I'm going to yeah, we're going to have heterogeneity and delta coming through individuals being one of two types, okay. and they're going to have higher delta people and lower delta people. Um, what the other thing that you you uh, I think there's lots of Oh, yeah, so we can have firm types. You can put firm types into this model really easily. Well, in that case, it's about the firm. So that, that would be how you'd get the correlation of the wages. So you could have a low-paying firm that lays off people left and right. That would be totally fine. As long as I can observe the firm type, I'm going to have a different offer distribution for that firm type, and I'm going to have a different uh, destruction rate for that firm type. So that would get you the correlation between... When you say observable, observable from factors other than the wage itself. 
Well, I, I want. Well, I'd have to pre-classify. We don't. We don't. We don't know all the things we'd like to know about the firm. Yeah. So I would pre-classify firms in some way using some reduced form way to pre-classify firms. Then, then you would take that as an observed structure. Once you have that, then everything's going to go through because you can effectively do it by firm type. The other thing that you can do is if you actually observed whether people quit versus were laid off, quits could totally depend on wages. That would fit nicely because then it's still type one extreme value. You, know, you have a logistic preference shock associated with quitting and we could just use that in there directly. That would be no problem. But then you would still need the layoff rate to not depend on the wage, except through some observed firm type. Okay, So you can see there's lots of ways you can expand it, but you can't do everything, right? Um, so what, once we have this in, in the simple setup, when you express the difference in the value function, so the right-hand side of that is just the difference in the value functions, then you can see that the only unknown in that whole unknowns that equation are UW prime minus UW. So you're going to get the flow utility UW is going to be identified up to a constant, which would be what is standard in dynamic discrete choice models. If you want to assume that UW is, you know, uh, CARA, that's no problem. We can show that, uh, actually, CRA, I think, is what we did. Um, we can show identification clearly of, of that. Uh, but everything else is going to be up to constant. Okay, so that's sort of the employed side. When we get to the unemployed side, I thought what we were going to need to do is really exploit the variation over time to pin down particular things. And it turns out you don't need to do that. You can just go point by point and recover everything. So what do I mean by that? We can start by identifying, so now that's the employed side. Now we're gonna do the unemployed side. What does um, the wage offer distribution look like here? I know it's probably not that fun to grind through identification. I just think it's so cool that things work out so well with these closed form expressions of these things. Um, I remember feeling this way when I was working on the paper with Bob on CCPs and I'd find, discover something and I'd tell him and I'd say, yeah, that was in Altug and Miller <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> but it's neat that, that these relationships work out so well. Uh, so in any event, let's look at the log odds between accepting a job that pays W versus W prime out of unemployment. If you do that, you just end up with VW minus VW prime because the, that, if you didn't take the job, the value of unemployment is going to be the same for those two things. That's pretty restrictive in terms of you think about how much over-identified stuff you've got there, right? Because any time period with those wages, you're always going to end up with that difference in those value functions there. So what are we going to do? We're going to do the same trick we did on the employed side to some extent. We're going to plug in for PWT with the hazard HWT, which we know, and then the denominator, we don't know either of those things. Okay. So what we can do is we're going to denote that difference on the right-hand side by kappa WW prime. And what we're going to do is we can solve this expression that we have substituted in uh, the, for PWT in the equation up there. And you can actually solve it for lambda zero of T. So lambda zero of T equals that mess on the right hand side where the only unknowns are the GWs. Choose another pair on the Ws and we get rid of the lambda zero T. Now you can rewrite this thing as a linear function. So we're going to denote the numerators, which are known. The only unknowns here are those Gs. Everything else we either see from the data or have already solved for. So we end up with this linear equation. And so for that particular set of four wages, we have this nice linear equation. If you think about all the non-redundant equations here, you end up with a linear system with W minus one unknowns, because the, the sum of the probabilities has to go to one for the 
So it's W minus one unknowns, and you get W times W minus one over two minus one equations. So once you get about three, you're, you're set, and you got, again, you're way over identified at every point in time. So that actually gives you closed form expression for the offer distribution changing over time uh, out of unemployment. You get the lambda zero immediately after that, and then the probability of uh, taking the job immediately follows. So again, no differential equation at any point. Everything has closed form expressions. So Monibo's model is more complicated in some respects, but he did say that identification was hard to show on it, right? <laughs> uh, here we can show identification. In the simple model, it's probably violated in the data. But at least we can show identification. <laughs> uh, so now we got to recover V0 of T, the value function out of unemployment. We're going to use the law of gods for that. That law of gods expression, we're substituting the value of employment is in the numerator there. Note that that's got a V0 of zero there, and there's a V0 of T. Well, evaluate the expression at V0 of zero. The only unknown in that line is then V0 of zero, which you can solve out for. So V0, zero has that nice form. V0, T immediately follows, okay? And so then to get the, now you have to differentiate the V0 of T to get the V0 dot. Uh, and you do need that to get the employment benefits uh, where I forgot the V0 dot. There's a V0 dot on the end that you would substitute in for uh, there. But everything works out quite nicely. The one thing you have to do is one little derivative. Okay. How much time do I have left? Okay, plenty of time. Uh, so let's look at the estimation. I view the estimation, I say plenty of time, because I view the estimation as really illustrating the identification, you know, that we can apply this. Not so much for anything um, beyond that. So more of a toy example. We're going to look at administrative data from Hungary. We get lots of observations. You sort of observe things somewhat daily, uh, at least on the unemployment side. Um, we've got, we're going to be focused on this particular period because of the way the unemployment benefits work. We're going to split, for purposes of some of the descriptions I'm going to show you, we're going to go for 10 deciles. They're going to be sort of equally spaced. I think that's on current wages, so it might have been unaccepted. I meant to look that up before the talk. Uh, except for the first spin. Lots of people make the minimum wage in Hungary. So we're going to collapse the first spin to one and then sort of equally space the other ones. For the purposes of the descriptors, we'll look at 10 just so you can see what the patterns are in the data. But we're going to use 50 uh, when we estimate. And here's sort of what the transition matrix looks like on accepted wages. To me, it's something that should be shown in all these sort of search papers. Because uh, it just shows you it's going to be really hard to match anything that looks like this. Okay? So what do you see? Well, you do see that there are more. If we start off at a current wage, the current wage two, uh, you're generally going to have more transitions up than down. Okay? But there's lots of transitions down. And you can also see that they're centered along the diagonal. And this gets into the issue about where these offers are coming from. So we have a proof for when the offer distribution uh, depends on your current wage, but that doesn't have a nice closed form and and such. We, we can show identification, we don't get the closed form. So not, not even worrying about time, this is just the observed job to job transitions. We're going to be w estimating the continuous time transitions and all these things. So this isn't the, this is just all the transitions we have in the data. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I mean, the bigger issue in my mind is moving from 10 to 1. <laughs> like, well, why are you doing that? You know, that, that seems crazy. <laughs> Oh, there is a there's a big difference. Um, yeah, and we, we should probably look at what sort of jobs, what 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 characteristics of that um, is happening. Go for it. Sorry, we're focused on men here. So yeah, so I, I don't know what the numbers look like for women, um, but. It would be interesting to estimate the whole thing separately for women and see what um, what differences we get in terms of offer arrival rates and all those wage offer distributions to actually see where the the big differences are. These are just counts of the transitions. So conditional on moving. So maybe this. Um, oh, it's Budapest. Okay, thank you. All right, it's not the whole country. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not actually. I need to go back and check. <laughs> but so focused on identification. <laughs> 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 the US the US is, the US have this going down. Yeah. For whatever reason. It is asymmetric, but less asymmetric than the Yeah, well, I'd love to see that table. That'd be nice. Um, so this sort of shows you, um, if we look at the transitions, you know, how much are they going to a wage change more than 5%, less than 5% within that smaller range? And you can see it's all over the place. Uh, Shmudiba thinks that must be something wrong with the data <laughs> that you would see such such big changes. For the, the frequency you're measuring, you think it might matter a little bit in the sense that, you know, if you're looking at just annual income versus annual income and, and not not something that's like quarterly that might be bouncing around, because you might be capturing a lot of trends before you need changes. Is this wages or earnings? This is earnings. So, so you know, someone like a seasonal worker or going part time, that might be doing a bit, but something that's over a longer frequency. Yeah, that's possible. Um, one of the nice things here is I like, uh, you can see this are quartiles of the unemployment duration, and you can see that the accepted wage falls over time. Not surprising. That could be two sources. It could be you're becoming less willing to, uh, you know, more willing to take those low wage jobs as you get closer to benefit expiration. It can also be selection, right? That the some people are uh, are better suited, uh, or the better uh, able workers are able to get out of unemployment faster. So our approach to estimation, we're going to estimate, we're going to first classify workers into one of two types, um, where we're effectively going to get the, the conditional probability of being at each of the two types. And those types, there's going to be lots of flexibility in terms of what they affect. Given those uh, Posterior probabilities, we're going to estimate the employed side parameters. We do let the offered wage distribution depend on the current wage. And the offered wage is going to follow sort of an ordered logit with flexible a polynomial for the cut points. Okay? That's how we're going to discretize things. And then on the unemployed side, offer arrival rates are going to follow a flexible polynomial in time. And then the cut points for offered wages. Uh, also follow, uh, you know, sort of a flexible polynomial in time. So if we look at the employed side parameters, we do get these two types. Type two is like 15%. They have higher offer arrival rates where you really see differences is in the job destruction rate. Uh, the type ones are just much more likely to lose their jobs. And then when you think about what the offered wage distribution, if you're in the first decile, you can see you're about like in your uh, type one, about 60% of your offers are going to be uh, in from the first 
from the first uh, bin. But if you get to the higher bins, you can see it's going to be going way down. And so you're going to get better offers if your current wage is higher in this setup. And on the unemployment side, you can see that um, the offered wages start off, you get very few, much fewer offered wages at the minimum at the beginning, but then over time, it increases quite a, quite a bit. And you see that the gaps between the, the two types uh, sort of converge. At first, the, t the type twos are much less likely to get those really low wage uh, job offers. So the main point is we can recover all this stuff. There might be some stuff on the back end that would be interesting to, to do with it. Uh, and it's this estimation takes no time, even though we're not doing it in Excel. Here's sort of what the offer arrival rates out of unemployment. Uh, these are would correspond at the yearly level. So that's actually pretty high on the type twos in terms of how often those those offers are coming in. You can see it generally follows that downward slope. Uh, to the extent that you would ever see an upward uh, slope, you can easily think about think about this being duration dependent so it's going downward, but there's the other part too, which is your search effort, um, which would be going potentially the other direction. And then this is sort of what's happening, the flow utility of unemployment benefits. Um, as you approach benefit expiration for type ones, you see this sort of going down quite a bit. We're a little surprised you didn't get that for the, the type twos. So to wrap up, um, by introducing preference shocks, which we view as a staple of the dynamic distribution choice literature into job search models, identification estimation becomes much, much simpler. Uh, and we can take these non-stationary models and completely avoid solving the differential equation, at least for the purposes of estimation. Even if you were solving the model to do like a counterfactual, Arnaud assures me, this, again, the person has not taken a differential equations class, um, that instead of a second order differential equation, you actually have a first order differential equation, which we can actually solve much easier. Um, we, it does allow for substantial flexibility, unemployed offered wages, arrival rates, and benefits are all allowed to, to vary over time, and the data suggests that each of these are sort of uh, important. What I was hoping to be able to show you, which I don't have here, is you can think about what is the markup of offered wages over accepted wages and how that changes over the course of your unemployment uh, duration. So I'll end with that.